Hello, good morning, everybody. Good morning. You're very welcome uh, to our uh, RPA uh, overview uh, workshop. And um, we have a very exciting agenda uh, today, some fantastic speakers. Uh, robotic process automation is one of the buzzwords of our time and it's going to be very important for our health service. Uh, so my name is Martin Curley. I'm the Director of Digital Transformation. And a key part of the Digital Transformation is the Digital Academy. And we're delighted today to announce uh, the collaboration between the HSE Digital Academy and the UI, UiPath Academy, and also a joint collaboration with uh, Deloitte, who were the winners uh, or are part of the uh, deeper uh, national government uh, framework. Uh, <clears throat> I want to briefly uh, talk to you um, and give you an overview of the HSE Digital Academy, uh, where the alignment is with robotic process automation. And then we have a uh, fantastic sort of cadre of speakers uh, that will take us through first with Mark O'Connor talking about an overview of robotic process automation and then we have other speakers talking about the various uh, education offerings. We're delighted to have so many people actually showing interest uh, in this uh, seminar and robotic process automation. Some people in the health service will be able to make a career uh, out of the robotic process uh, automation work, whether that's as a business analyst for robotic process automation or whether it's for a developer as a developer uh, or as, as a user. So without further ado, um, I will just uh, introduce the Digital Academy and uh, then we can get into the meat of, of uh, today's work. <clears throat> so in terms of digital transformation, um, the Irish Health Service is classified as a laggard. And this is based on quite a few benchmarks, but particularly the OECD Health in the 21st uh, Century, which you know establishes Ireland as a laggard, particularly in the acute section and in, in the community section. And we currently estimate that Ireland is somewhere between a level one and level two between an initial and basic uh, status. But our, our, our goal uh, by uh, five years time is that we will have moved uh, to be um, a European leader in, in digital uh, health. Uh, you know, what are our objectives in terms of digital transformation? We want to accelerate the adoption of digital technology solutions with leaders across the organization to transform Irish healthcare. Uh, we want to support and influence digitally driven change across the organization and support the successful implementation of technology care. We want to build a consistent vocabulary, language and tone across the organization. And last, we want to deliver a digital learning program to a wide range of staff in the health service. So we have uh, five pillars in our digital transformation strategy. The first one is the digital academy, which we're talking about today. And uh, we have a pillar around open innovation. We have a pillar around digital labs and an innovation portfolio. Uh, we have a pillar around the digital academy forum. And lastly, we have uh, a pillar around digitization. And today RPA links primarily with the digital academy and the digitization uh, uh, vector. So we're talking about the Digital Academy. Uh, this is the architecture of the Digital Academy and the flagship of what we're doing in the Digital Academy is a Masters in Digital Health Transformation that we uh, launched at the start of the year. And over the yesterday and today, we actually have 22 digital change projects being reviewed by IPOSI, by patient advocates and, and patients. And the Masters in Digital Health Transformation uh, is, is our key mechanism for driving digital change at scale throughout the organization. As I mentioned earlier, we're delighted to partner with both Deloitte and, Deloitte and UiPath in terms of the robotic process automation uh, component of the architecture of the Digital Academy. And we're hoping that in September, uh, we will have our first uh, boot camp uh, kick off. There are two main paths uh, that we are um, following in terms of um, the, the Digital Academy RPA training. There's a path with UiPath and UiPath are offering for free uh, their online uh, virtual academy work. Uh, UiPath will also be partnering with an Irish university to help deliver that training. 
And we also have a second path with Deloitte and Deloitte are providing cross government, cross civil service uh, training um, around uh, robotic process automation. Uh, digitization is the other key vector that we're talking about today. And RPA is one of the fastest growing segments of AI and workplace uh, automation. You'll, you'll hear from Mark and from Chris, um, it just exactly what RPA is. And you know the, the stat there from 2018, there was a 63% growth increase in RPA investments. And RPA is, um, provides robust capabilities for boosting productivity and efficiency at a time when skilled talent is in short supply. Um, if looking at the heat map for healthcare providers, uh, this is looking at all the tasks and processes uh, that are involved in the e-health ecosystem, document triage, pharmacy, reimbursement, and so on. Uh, you can see many of these tasks or processes are blue, and that means they have high automation potential. So we're really in the very early stages of the adoption of RPA in the healthcare ecosystem and supply chain and value chain. And we know that there are many opportunities for, for adoption. Uh, we categorize the key target areas for RPA in healthcare into patient access, consultation and care, revenue cycle and, and supply chain. And Kevin Kelly from HPS is together with Tom Laffin, they are both chartered with leading the implementation of RPA and in the HSC and beyond. And Kevin will be speaking later on and sharing about how we're organization, organizing uh, for RPA um, in, the, in the HSC and beyond. <clears throat> I shared a maturity model at the start of my presentation and I'll finish uh, with this maturity model. And this model really just tells the story that this is not just a flash in the pan. We won't just be busy with RPA for six months and then it'll be done. Um, as part of the five year transformation journey uh, of the health service in, digital, in terms of digital transformation, we'll also be going on a five year transformation journey using RPA. And you know, after a five year period, we hope a significant number of processes at the HSC uh, will have been automated, freeing up workers from sort of um, boring, not so high value adding work and allowing them to focus on much higher value adding uh, work. So I'm going to stop there. I'm going to hand you over to Philip McGrath, um, who is uh, from the Our Public Service uh, 2020 Innovation Team. And Philip and his colleagues have been doing a fantastic work thinking about how to digitalize um, and innovate across the health service. Um, you know, Philip has great support from Lucy Fallon Byrne and from Robert Watt, the Deputy Secretary General and the Secretary General of Deeper. So uh, Philip is going to share uh, what's the overall government approach to RPA uh, before we get into some of the more, uh, the, the more detail that you've come to listen to. Okay, over to you, Philip. Thanks, Martin. Hi, Martin, it's Mark here. Can I get you to stop sharing? Perfect. There we go. Can we all see that? Yep. We can indeed, Philip. All right, brilliant. So my name is Philip McGrath and I'm from the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform, where I lead on public service innovation policy. And uh, so that involves uh, testing new and emerging technologies within the public service and um, delivering a public service innovation strategy, um, but also managing uh, the rollout of RPA within the public service. Um, I've also been involved in setting up an innovation team within uh, Deeper and designing uh, an innovation fund, which is now being delivered by that team. Um, so I suppose innovation is really at the heart of what I do. Um, it's absolutely fantastic to see um, what's happening in the HSE now. I think when we started out on this journey, um, this is exactly how I would have envisaged RPA panning out, and that is having sectoral centers of excellence supported by that sort of um you know the 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 upskilling piece which um 
Martin and his team uh, are, are driving now in the health sector. Um, in, in terms of a background and where RPA came from, um, I suppose we saw this uh, technology back in around, I did a bit of research on it in around 2015 and into 2016. And it was, this was a disruptor in the outsourcing industry. So I suppose at the time I was working on uh, looking at areas of the public service that might be better delivered uh, using contracting arrangements. But when we saw that RPA was actually, uh, I suppose, uh, was changing the landscape of outsourcing. We thought, well, why would we bother going down the, the you know, the middleman route? Uh, why don't we look at um, introducing RPA ourselves, and uh, you know, building a, a skills and capacity within our own organisations to us uh, get rid of all of these mundane, laborious, repetitive tasks, uh, and also to build our own digital skills within within public service bodies and we noticed it was sort of trends in like labor arbitrage so reversal of those trends so where, where organizations used to um used to outsource processes to south africa or india or whatever they were actually being onshored and organizations were doing them processes themselves using rpa so um I suppose what happened was we went looking for a bit of money to do a pilot and um, we said it look this supports the digital agenda and it could also help us to reduce uh, costs and to uh, reverse or to arrest at least um, you know growth in numbers in areas that we really shouldn't be uh, growing numbers so in, in process areas and um, so we managed to get some money and we went out to a number of organizations um, we went out to uh, all civil service bodies and we asked, is anybody interested in doing a, a pilot within their organizations? We, we got four that we selected uh, based on the processes and the people that they put forward. And they were the Property Registration Authority of Ireland, the Revenue Commissioners, um, Public Appointments, and it, as People Point as it then was, which is now the, the National Shared Services Office. And uh, those organizations, uh, they've put forward a number of uh, processes that they've thought would be suitable for RPA. Um, we, we then put in place a governance committee, so a, an oversight board to, to I suppose, to, to watch over the, the pilot project as it went along. And I suppose the, the outcome of the pilot project was um, after 12 months, there were tw 24 processes that were completed or at the final stage of development. We noticed a huge improvement in terms of business information, and that's really down to the audit, auditable nature of RPA tools. Uh, the return on investment was achieved. Um, we that project cost us about one hundred and ten thousand, um, but we know that the uh, return on the processes that were automated, um, you know, that that was achieved fairly quickly within within uh, a number of months, and certainly over the year of the the pilot project. Uh, processing times had. Uh, there was a huge improvement there. So uh, like the lowest improvement was that the process was done twice as fast, but the best was actually 25 times as fast uh, as before. And the quality of the process is improved. There was no human error. Um, and the exception rates were fairly low. So they ranged the, the lowest range of exceptions. And, and I think Mark will probably get into this later, but that's really where the robot doesn't know what to do. So the lowest was 0.3% of the process and the highest was 9%. So, you know, one in 10, the robot didn't know what to do. Um, and then at the end, we had about 13 people that were trained up on how to use RPA. Uh, I won't go through all the, the, the conclusions of the pilot project, but just to say, uh, it really aligned with what I suppose the, the literature says around RPA. Um, and we did find it was really, really effective for the right types of processes. Uh, that the people that you train up, you really need them to be sort of logically minded. They need to understand that sort of if then scenarios. You, you, you can't just pick anyone, I don't think, uh, to, to implement RPA. Um, they need to be people that really sort of understand uh, the logic around a process. Um, we found that the ancillary benefits were as good as the cost savings. So the, the, the data improvements, uh, staff were a lot happier. Um, and we know for a fact now in a number of the centers of excellence where staff actually look to have their, their processes uh, automated. Less human error uh, and uh, there's less appeals and follow up and stuff like that. So 
Um, and the recommendations really that came out of it was, you know, that you need to identify enough processes before you, 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 um, you know, you, you go out to, 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 to start your RPA journey, um, that you should build internal capacity. And uh, one of the recommendations is to put in place an RPA framework to take away the procurement pain for public sector bodies. So that's what we did then. Um, just a couple of pointers for public sector bodies that are considering RPA. Um, it is a stated goal under the government's public service reform plan, which is our public service 2020. And we aim for public service bodies to become self-sufficient in their RPA deployment. Uh, trade unions have been briefed at general council level, so that's where uh, top management and staff associations meet uh, on a monthly basis. Uh, it's not a panacea. It, uh, you use conventional or built bought solutions if and when they are required. Uh, we would say that you should think outside your own area of expertise and look elsewhere within your organization for, for where this, um, this solution can be implemented, uh, except that you will have to put in some time and some money uh, to get this off the ground. Um, that you should make sure that your contractors are reflecting this, uh, their, their use of RPA and pricing arrangements. So where you have outsourced arrangements in place, you should be looking, uh, using um, gain sharing arrangements and innovation clauses to try and get RPA uh, reflected, I suppose, in your own pricing arrangements. Um, and then in terms of the governance piece, in August 2019, when we put in place a procurement framework for the whole public service, uh, our Secretary General wrote out to all public sector bodies, sort of asking them to engage uh, with the with the framework and to start looking at our, our processes within their organisations uh, that they can automate using RPA. Uh, and that was formalised then further in last December when uh, we put a... Uh, a memorandum to government looking for a decision on digital public services and a part of that memorandum uh, stipulated that public sector bodies must assess their suitability for RPA um, and hopefully uh, when you people become a lot more um, proficient in RPA we can get you to join the public service RPA network. Um, so uh, sorry I just Okay, so what's next for us will be to build uh, a public service network of RPA specialists to make automations shareable across the public service. And that's something that I think is happening already in the HSE, but we would like to see that uh, expanded across the wider public service where there's going to be uh, a lot of different processes that can be uh, replicated, whether it be in the education sector or the defense sector or the health sector or the education sector, or whatever it may be. Uh, we want to see centers of excellent de excellence developed. Um, and then of course, we're gonna to have to follow up on the government decision. So if public sector bodies are not using RPA, the question that we're gonna to have to be asking is why not? So that's where we, that's where we, we intend to go next. Um, my details are available to you there. Um, so if, if you want to get in touch to learn more about um, the central government approach or to understand how the framework operates in terms of procurement, I'm happy to uh, take any questions in relation to that. So. Um, okay, so I'll, uh, thanks very much for your time, and I'm going to hand you over. Um, sorry, I think I'm handing over to Chris Doddridge. Chris Doddridge. 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 Okay. Good so. evening, indeed. Yeah, thanks for that. For that. I think that was a, a good session. I think most importantly, the um, I think the build up of skills of subject matter experts within your own business is really key to the success of this. So uh, I think that was a really co a key call out. Um, so. I don't have any slides to share. Um, I just have a, a kind of a message to message to deliver. Um, so I'm Chris Edridge. I'm the managing director for the for Ireland and the UK. I'll get it the right way around uh, when I'm saying it on this on this presentation format. Um, but I'm actually on holiday at the moment, and uh, so if, if we do get a little bit of background noise, please forgive me. Um, but I'm so excited about this project that, that I, I wouldn't let Mark go without letting me say a couple of words of, uh, of support for this project. Um, so if you'll indulge me just for five minutes, I thought I'd just by kicking off by thanking uh, Martin, Kevin and Lorraine um, for the great work they're doing with the, the Digital Academy. Uh, and Kevin, obviously, who's the driving force behind automation within the HSC and how it's got the potential to transform the, the Irish national healthcare system. Um, 
and, and frankly, I've been amazed with the work that we've been doing so far. Um, you know, from, from start to finish, this, this project has blown me away uh, with people on both sides and our partners as well in Deloitte. Um, but when Mark first told me about the Digital Academy, the, sorry, excuse me, the Digital Academy and the positive approach for the innovation that they're trying to drive across the business, um, the first thing I saw is that it was actually quite encouraging that change was being embraced but not resisted. Um, and quite obviously, I realised that that was a perfect culture fit for us at UiPath. Um, and I had on good assurance from Mark from the outset that he was reassuring, reassuring me that we were putting every effort. Uh, behind driving this together to reflect your mutual drive for the outcomes that you were looking for. Um, I personally believe it's it's fantastic that the HSE is starting with the most important thing, which is the bedrock of this project, the skills and, and building digital leaders that have a clear mission statement um, to deliver uh, innovation, but also cost effective health um, services within Ireland. I'm also delighted and blown away to see the master's program that was co-designed uh, by the HSE Digital Academy and the eight Irish universities that I understand are participating at this stage. You know, if we just pause and reflect on what's really important in this move to a far more digital world, um, it's the skill shortage, it's the skill uh, desire that, that, that drives projects of this scale um, and to have that preparation into your long-term future again is something that we equally hold up uh, as a business as exemplary to, to how many other public bodies and in fact corporates need to think about their, their future digital projects. Um, so with, with us partnering with the HSC Digital Academy we've invested heavily in our own academic alliances and our own academy skills to empower the workers to, to master the fundamentals of, of robotic process automation um, and what that is obviously going to deliver is giving people the subject matters that as Philip referenced the knowledge and hands-on experience to see how the business automation that will be delivered into all of the processes across the health service uh, will have far-reaching impacts on the way that people work I think the reference to you know manual repetitive work that that no one really wants to do is, is the type of work that we are referring to here but actually it will extend into you know supporting end-to-end -end processes that actually will make everyone's world's lives um, and hopefully careers more more uh, more enjoyable uh, because it will remove the stuff that none of us enjoy um, I've also been blown away uh, by the work um, in this area uh, and especially around the matter hospital work that we've done um, I'm not sure if everyone is familiar with the, the detail there but it inspired us so much that we actually created a video to showcase our feelings around our objections or sorry and obligations in the healthcare sector so if you haven't seen that before we'll make the, the link available I'm showing it now in a minute Chris oh fair, fair enough I should have probably attended the prep call so that I don't uh, <laughs> I don't say silly things like that but um, but again that really was built to motivate, so that was built to showcase how we feel about our, our obligation in, in this sector. Um, but I'll just finish off by saying, you know, our ambition is to make RPA and the education and training available to, to anyone with the ambition to pursue it, uh, is basically our, our field. We've always democratised learning around our capabilities and that will never change. Um, you know, Mark and Francis uh, are leading the collaboration between UiPath and the HSC um, to deliver this programme. And it's aimed at educating these digital leaders, building a digital uh, platform for, for, for digital transformation with the Irish healthcare system. And, and you know, I'm 100% behind that and delighted with the work that we're doing. So I just wanted to jump on and thank everyone that's been involved so far and, and offer my unwavering support and businesses unwavering support to keep driving this across you know, the health service, but also further public services as we grow in partnership. So that's me. Thank you to everyone and uh, I'll hand over to Mark. Thanks Chris. Um, I'm just going to share my screen here folks. Um, so from this, there we go. I'm going to do what everyone does. Can everybody see this? We can Mark. Okay. Um, firstly, there is a Q&A section uh, at the bottom of the screen, so if anyone has any questions, uh, feel, feel free uh, to, to put a question to, to us and we will answer the questions at the end. Um, what I'm going to do is firstly introduce myself. Uh, I'm Mark O'Connor. I look after the public sector business for UiPath here in Ireland. I'm ably assisted by Francis Donoghue. 
Um, and we also have a, a team of other people who support us, but we're the people driving the work that's taking place with the, with the HSC at the moment, with the Digital Academy, and we're working very closely in partnership with the team in Deloitte. What we're going to do here is just give a quick whirlwind uh, what is RPA, um, then we're going to go into the work we're doing in partnership with the Digital, uh, Digital Academy and the HSE, how we can enable people to do their own training and their own time, which will supplement the training that Deloitte are doing, and how our long-term investment with the Irish universities. And, you know, it's, it's we fundamentally believe, and we're very much in line with the vision that Martin has for the HSE, it's all about the people. It's all about upskilling the people, making use of the technology, and using automation to support the great work that's been done in the HSC. And I'm going to show this video that Chris talked about here. This video is inspired by the project we did in the Mather Hospital. And it was really much inspired by the nursing team in the Mather Hospital who reached out to us um, actually prior to the pandemic, but they could see this coming down the line. And this was the infection control team in the Mather Hospital. So I just play this video here. No sound, Mark, I'm afraid it's coming through. You're going to have to stop sharing your slides. And when you reshare, uh, share okay. with, and share with original sounds. So you have to stop sharing and then reshare. But there's a little box okay. to tick. I, I, I thought I clicked it. Apologies. We'll forgive you. I apologize, Chris. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll just go back from the beginning here. Yeah. Do we have sound now, folks? And then one day, the world changed. It said, you want to see scary? I'll show you scary. And like that, it took away the thing we love most, the thing we need most, being together. Businesses closed. Hospitals were overwhelmed. The world seemed to stop. It asked for heroes, nurses and doctors and paramedics, but as they fought on one front, another appeared, as insidious as the virus itself. Testing and paperwork and supply chain issues, creating barriers between the healthcare worker and the patient. Help us, they said, help us do our job, because nowhere in a medical oath does it say anything about paperwork. So they sent in reinforcements, and they called it robotic process automation, to clear a 160-day registration backlog in a single day, to provide more accurate test results in one-third the time, to reduce the screening time of healthcare workers to four hours from five days, to cut the processing time of an application from 45 minutes to five minutes, to accelerate the distribution of loans to help keep businesses alive. This isn't just about the coronavirus. It's about helping to solve the greatest challenges in medicine, business, life. Faster, more efficiently. Think about what's possible if we eliminate drudgery, time-wasted repetitive tasks. This is where hope meets technology, so that we can all go back to doing the greatest thing, the most valuable thing, the thing that says we're not afraid anymore, bringing the world back together. Okay, the idea behind that video was very much inspired by the team in the Mather Hospital there and their vision of how highly trained nurses that worked in the infection control area, that the burden could be lifted off them on the amount of paperwork that they need to do. And we'll talk about that a little bit further later on. But what can a robot do? And these are all the technical things that a robot can do, but I'm gonna make it simple for people here. And in reality, the robot will log on to any application. It will move any files and folders, read and write to databases, scrape data from the web, connect to systems APIs, extract documents, open emails, and make calculations. So in reality, it can do a lot of the work you hate doing yourself. And what was interesting when we worked with the team at the Manor Hospital, we realized before a nurse could actually see a patient in the infection control area, they have to spend four hours doing paperwork before they could actually visit a patient. And we were like, well, 
okay, could a robot do that work for you? And they said, well, our vision, Mark, is to walk in every morning and the paperwork is done for us. And we get an email and our patients are assigned to us. And we said, well, okay, how do you get there? Well, they said, well, there's a number of steps that need to be followed. And I said, well, is it rules-based? Does it follow a rule? Yeah, it does. So we just sat down with them and they were able to use one of our tools, um, a task capture, which is part of Automation Hub, which is very much part of the vision that Kevin Kelly has within the HSE. And they recorded their own process. And we had a workflow within 15 minutes. And they were able to hand it over to us and said, these are all the steps we have to take. And we were saying, well, that's perfect for automation. And within a couple of weeks, we had the whole process automated. Then they came back to us and said, well, the robot could do, you know, the robot has 24 hours in a day. It's only taken a couple of minutes to do that. What else could it do? And now um, this afternoon or half 12 today, I have 40 uh, staff in the Mather Hospital doing training on Automation Hub because they have so many ideas on where automation could help the teams within the Mather Hospital right across the board. As Martin mentioned earlier, in healthcare, like, you know, look, everything that Martin had in blue there, we've got similar stuff here. But in reality, think about it. It could be anywhere in, in the HSE. It could be in finance. It could be in supply chain. It could be in IT. It could be in HR. It could be in customer service, you know, supporting side of things. It really is. It's up. You guys know better than anyone else. We're just here to help you with your vision of where automation can help you. I'm not going to steal Kevin's thunder, but these are, and Kevin's going to talk about these projects we did with HBS and the Health Surveillance Protection Center. But the things that really jumped out to me during COVID-19, we were able to get these processes up and running. And some of the time savings were phenomenal. And the, and the ability for this to be done collaboratively with all the people across different locations and roll this out uh, during COVID was, it was pretty amazing. Um, obviously, the health battalions, and Kevin will go through this in, in greater detail, but some of the savings, like 500 hours being saved in the national personal records, you know, that in reality, when you bring that back to means, that means people get hired faster and quicker and are in the front line faster. When we talk about our Mara Hospital story, our technology enabled this woman's vision. You know, Jinsi Jerry, she's the Assistant Director of Nursing for Infection and Prevention Control in the Matter Hospital. And I was talking at the HISI conference last year and Jinsi uh, came up to me and said, I think uh, or, you know, RPA would be perfect for my team. And she said, I have a vision of freeing up nurses to be nurses. And I said, okay, explain further. She said, well, we've highly trained staff who are doing administrative work, which has taken up nearly half of their day. And I want them to see patients. I want them to show empathy. I want them to come up with better ways of providing care because the paperwork is rules based. But from compliance reasons and health, you know, um, obviously recording reasons, all the paperwork needs to be done. But she said, I could love an, a digital assistant. And they even had a competition where they named the robot recently. Um, and there was a bit of banter within the hospital because they said the robot has to have a male name. Even though the robot works 15 times faster than any, any human worker, it's because the robot can only do one task at a time and only women can multitask. But what's happened here is that this has really shown the entire hospital and the vision of Alan Sharp, who's the CEO of the hospital, is that automation will be rolled out in, across the entire hospital, uh, in every area of the hospital. And realistically, what we're saying here is, but the ideas need to be generated from yourselves. And what we're doing today is a training and automation hub on how people can translate those ideas and submit those ideas so that people can review them and see what makes the, mess, the best sense for these to be rolled out. And happy to do similar training and we will be announcing further training on Automation Hub. We've been doing it across HBS at the moment. And next week we will be launching the next phase of our Automation Hub training, uh, which will be available to all HSC employees. And that will be followed on with more detailed business analyst training, as Martin said, because in reality, 
there are new careers to be made on the work that is taking place here. We have a great video which we did with Jinsi where she details all the work we did with the team and Dara from the nursing team as well. Uh, I can send on the link to anybody on, on that video as well. Obviously, it's not just in healthcare uh, that we're working. We worked with the Department of Employment and Social Protection and we basically, we used our technology to make sure the Irish citizens were able to get paid the pandemic unemployment benefit. And so RPA was used in the background to help process the application forms that came through and over 600,000 of these individuals were paid by the end of April. Um, you know, as part of our commitment to Ireland, we just gave the department the software and we said you can have the software for free until the end of September and we provided our resources for free, just like we did in the Mather Hospital. Because we didn't think it was the time to, you know, obviously the procurement is in place, but we just said, look guys, what do you need, when do you need it and how can we help? You know, and that's the position where we're in. And now it's going to become, as Philip said earlier on, part of the normal business within the organization there. If anybody's renewed their passport in the last, uh, since September 2018, uh, and it's probably they've used the UiPath robot without actually realizing that they have. Um, they both saved over 7,300 hours, have been identified. But then what happened here was, was a really interesting um, the reason RPA was rolled out, it was in the height of Brexit and there was such volume of people in the UK looking for Irish passports that the renewals of existing passports were being delayed. So they said, well, look, we can go with an online service and use RPA to process this. And they were able to free up 12 staff to move into the Brexit team. And now that staff, once Brexit has calmed down, are now working in other areas within the organization and most of them have moved up the value chain in the organization. They've gone from doing a very repetitive job, now they're in the fraud section, now they're in other areas within the, within, within the passport office. So realistically what we're saying here is, review your processes and see where can you get the best value from your existing staff. You know, and as, as, as was mentioned by Philip earlier on and mentioned by Martin, staff will be happier when you take away this burden away from them. You know, from a security point of view, I, I tell a great story where I had one uh, government body who I met recently and they asked me, how secure is it? And I said, well, look, you know, we're used across the Irish government, we're used in the PSNI, um, which we worked with the team in Deloitte there. Um, and they said, look, they're deemed the most secure police force in Europe. We're, we're used by NASA, we're used by the CIA and people like that. And they said, well, oh, we, the answer back to me was, well, it's not, and they named the actual government department they were here, but they said they had their own standards. But we, I can confirm we've met those standards for them. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to pass on to my colleague, Francis, to realistically what we're here to talk about today is well, how do we upskill people? How do we show them the vision of our training and how we're supporting the Digital Academy here in the HSE? Thanks very much, Mark. Um, so, yeah, my name is Francis Donoghue and I'm a, a senior customer success manager in, in UiPath. And I thought um, before we go into a little bit more detail, maybe I thought it would be worthwhile talking about what exactly do we mean by, by customer success. So within, within UiPath, we are, um, I guess, a, a strategic organization where we work to, with, our, with our clients and our customers to, to identify and understand what your goals and objectives are, and then to ensure that those goals and objectives are achieved. But it's, it's really important for us to say that it's not just done in a, in a cursory way or a, it's done in a way which meets all regulatory governance requirements, uh, compliance and in line with best practices within the industry. And finally, we do it based on the experience, not just uh, from ourselves, but from our huge range of customers across the world and our partners. And as I've said to Kevin and the team there, our measure of success within the customer success organization, UiPath, is entirely measured by the success achieved by our customer. So if you're not successful, we're not successful, and it's, and it's aligned in terms of uh, what you have defined at the beginning as your goals and objectives. So we'll be continuing to partner very closely uh, on a long-term basis uh, with Kevin 
and with the COE and with the HSC uh, to make sure that these plans are, are, are defined in a way that are, that are measurable, that are achievable, and then that the automation journey can happen as, as efficiently and as fluidly and with as much value-driven uh, um, returns as possible. If we can go to the next slide, Mark. Yeah. Uh, so we, don't, we do it with, by delivering a whole range of services, and I've just highlighted a few of them here. This is just a sampling of what we can do from what we call our Unified Customer Success Program. Uh, we deliver uh, webinars which allow um, our customers to interact with, with strategy experts on topics that might be of interest. And, and these change depending on the, the requirements of the customer, but also change depending on trends, uh, new technologies, new capabilities, new ideas, new opportunities. Uh, so we make that available uh, on a very regular basis. And we provide not just live webinars for specific customers on specific topics, but we also invite our customers to attend lots of webinars as well that other customers or like-minded uh, uh, colleagues or partners might be interested in. We have what we call get started plans, and that's all about having using best practices, uh, using uh, checklists, step-by-step -step guidelines, uh, again, ensuring that your, your RPA readiness is as, is as mature and as complete as possible. Um, we have uh, success management, which is something that's very, very important to us. And what that means is that we're not, we're not reactive. Well, we, we are, but we're also very proactive. Uh, we look at the uh, automation solutions that are being deployed within the organization, make sure that they're running efficiently. Uh, we actively look at your customer, your, your needs, uh, to see if they uh, require any upgrades, any additional features, and really want to assist you in, in accelerating through any challenges that you might have um, through the, through the uh, implementation of your automation solutions. Uh, we have a vast range of libraries, and what we mean by that is it's everything from, again, from governance, process mining, evangelism of RPA across the organization, uh, and again, it's all very easy access all of these content libraries available uh, free of charge and, and uh, you know, we'll be encouraging the HSE and our colleagues there uh, to be leveraging them as much as possible, basically taking advantage of knowledge and experience that's already out there. A couple of other things, we have packages, but one of the things that we, we, we leverage quite a lot, which we look forward to doing with the HSC are what we call explore sessions. So they're just product demonstrations, but they're also proofs of concept uh, or proofs of value. So that might be, for example, if we have a, if you have a use case in a particular part of the HSE and you're not sure, is this something that might be uh, of value from, a, from an RPA perspective? Is it something that we can deliver a, a sort of return on? Is it something that's even achievable from a technology perspective? Uh, we, re, we run and set up these what we call these explorer sessions where we can test drive it, uh, a proof of value to see if we, if we actually do the automation, can you get the value back on it? And again, it's all about proving the return on investment, proving that we can do it in a, in a safe, secure way, but also doing it in a way that you get the benefit from the, from the work that's being done. And the whole point of all of this from a customer success perspective is to accelerate the, the transformation journey within the HSE. Um, the whole point, I guess, a key point of what we're talking about today is, is, is around uh, education and training. Uh, we, uh, it's been referenced a couple of times that we have what we call the UiPath Academy. The UiPath Academy was launched in 2017, and since then we've had over 500,000 registered uh, students from over 160 countries. And what we have here is a, an academy of learning which can bring you from a point of completely no knowledge to being at really at any level that you'd like to be from an RPA perspective perspective right through to being a highly qualified RPA developer or anywhere in between. Um, the training is, is made available by UiPath. As, as we've said before, it's free. It's available free of charge to everyone at the HSE. And we strongly encourage, um, if you're interested in learning more about RPA, whether it's technical, whether it's something that you're interested in, maybe from a business analysis perspective, or purely to see what could RPA do to improve my, my work my workspace, my environment, and therefore I'd like to learn a little bit more about it, we would strongly encourage that you take the opportunity just to spend some time doing that. Of course, as, as, as Martin mentioned, this is just a small part of the broader uh, education program that's being put in place. Uh, but we want to make it, you know, obviously, we want to evangelize about the fact that this training is available. We want, we want people, to, the more knowledge that we can share, and the sooner that people can upskill and, up, and increase their awareness of what the capability and the opportunity is, um, the better. 
we can go to the next slide. Yeah, so uh, you're going to hear in, in a few minutes about the uh, focused training that uh, our partners in Deloitte will be sharing as part of the as part of the RPA to RPA rollout. And again, as I said, um, I guess it's an opportunity for for anyone who's interested in in uh, increasing their knowledge. Uh, we have what we call learning journeys for different RPA roles. Um, we we want to we want to create a, a, an environment of transformation, an environment where we say, um, it, we're, however we're operating today, we could be operating differently tomorrow. And it's really a case of taking away the mundane work. It's a case of um, bringing ourselves to a point where we can take um, as, as, as uh, uh, take the, 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 the repeatable, the mundane, and, and, and bringing ourselves to a point where we have uh, more value add in terms of, and more, more interesting work to be doing. And to do that, uh, we think that education around the capability of not just RPA, but intelligent automation is, is really important. Um, so we can, we can skip on again. So we have what we ha ha call the um, Academy Training Catalogue. And we have three, basically three flavors of what's in the catalog. So we have, and this slide might be a little bit difficult to see, but we will be sharing the, the slides afterwards. Um, the first one is really just, it's what we call a starter kit. And it's, a, it's about just, it's your entry point into the RPA world. So from saying, what does RPA stand for? right down to building an automation. It's a small number of hours, but it's for people who've never interacted with RPA before, and you're just interested in just learning a little bit more about it. Um, the next one we have is what we call the, the RPA platform training portfolio. And what that's all about is product-based training. So we have a, we have a long list of products uh, in, from, from developers, uh, uh, different products in terms of process mining, task mining, and a lot of different technologies. So if you're particularly technically minded and you're in interested in a particular aspect of the RPA technology. We have product-based technologies groups there, very comprehensive plan uh, in terms of understanding from, again, from scratch right up to being completely uh, comfortable with the use of the technology right through to developing your own your own uh, automations yourself. And then the third one is what we have, what we call uh, uh, learning plans and training for training plans. And what they are is uh, based on particular roles. So as I mentioned already, uh, we've, we've had many, many people who have come onto the UiPath Academy who knew nothing about RPA, uh, have completed the training, have done some work, and become very accomplished in their space, whether it's as a business analyst, a solution architect, uh, highly qualified developers. And in fact, much of the training that our own developers do ourselves is come straight from the Academy. So. Um, uh, that's the third strand of, of uh, training opportunity that we have within the UiPath Academy. Um, I'll, I'll reiterate again that this training is available free of charge. It's available to everyone in the, in the HSE, and I'd strongly and, you know, encourage you to dip your toes into it and see how you get on. Now, I'll pass back to you, Mark, because this is just a small part of what we're doing in the whole training space, and maybe you could talk a little bit about the Academic Alliance. Yeah, thanks, Francis. You know, very much we view the HSE Digital Academy very much like we would view our partnership with universities all around the world. And um, we're really, you know, we love the we love the plans that Martin and the team have and Lorraine and Ross and Des that we've been we've been dealing with because it's investment in you as people, you know. And we're not just looking at because we've a track record of doing this. Uh, we've already partnered with NUI Galway. Uh, to train the accountancy students on robotic process automation. And we're looking to, to roll that out across the entire university into the computer science and business degrees. That's my colleague, Siobhan, who's based out of Limerick um, uh, with the team there in NUI Galway. And we very much see this along like the, uh, great, we're already partnering with the Chartered Accountants of Ireland to teach, teach new RPA skills because at the end of the day, this is an investment in, in Ireland as much as, as anything else, because we believe that we need to upskill the existing Diagra students coming from college for the new workforce that they're facing into, or the existing people who are already working because they need to understand how these, di these digital skills can be utilized in their own roles uh, within the organization. And, and as Francis said there, there are so many different roles in, in an RPA rollout, you could just be someone who generates the ideas. You could be the business analyst. 
who reviews the idea and creates the business plan. You can be the software developer who actually develops the software. You know, you can be the finance person who looks at how the return on investment or the efficiency improvements that are being made within this. But very much which is core to what we're doing is our investment in training. And as I said, with the other organizations we've already partnered with, we're already, only yesterday at the Leather Kenny Institute of Technology mail me asking, can they become a partner ourselves? We've just kicked off discussions with TU Dublin as well. And they're hoping to have their course ready for September. And what's great about this is everything's available online. You know, in the current environments that we're all in, anybody can be doing this in their own time or there can be structured time set aside for people to be able to do this. So that's why we feel it's a perfect fit to get people going as quickly as possible. It's online, it's free, you can register, you can do it in your own time. But as Francis said, we're here to do, you know, to support people. If you have queries or if you come across issues, like only yesterday I had Galway County Council who have two of their team who've done the UiPath Academy mail me saying they've used our free software, they've built their first two automations, but they've run into a problem, can we help them? And we had a custom, we had Alex from our uh, pre-sales team who's on the phone to them this morning or on a Zoom call going through that with them. So everything is there for you folks. We're, the, t the academy is ready to go. And what we fe feel ourselves is we really want to work in partnership, just like we do with the universities. And we want to repair students, educators, existing workers for the new workforce that is out there, the new jobs. But we also need to create the awareness of how this can actually benefit yourselves and benefit you know, existing staff. And that's where we feel by partnering with the, with the Digital Academy and the HSE, with the work we're doing in the Centre of Excellence with, with, with Kevin Kelly, with the work we're already doing with some of the hospitals. It's all about tying this all together and sharing the knowledge across the Irish healthcare sector to take Philip's point from earlier on, it is a center of excellence that is sharing knowledge across the entire Irish healthcare sector. So uh, I think that's, that's me for, for the moment. Uh, I'll be hanging on for Q&A, but I'm going to pass over now to Kevin Kelly. So we'll just get you. Yep. So are you seeing that there now, Mark? We are indeed, Kevin. We are indeed. <clears throat> I'm sorry if I stole any of your thunder, Kevin. Okay. That popped up there now? We have your background. Oh. Not yeah, in the slideshow. Okay. Very good. When you're going from slideshow, it's going into. Uh, are background. you on two? Are you on two screens, Kevin? I am. You might have to share on the other screen. Or Kevin, there's a little box you can tick when you come out of full screen to just just display on the primary screen. I'll stop sharing again. Okay, you seeing that now? So as you're starting screen sharing, now we have you. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so sorry about that. Um, my name is Kevin Kelly, and I work with the uh, business division of the HSE, so Health Business Services. Um, just want to give a quick intro on what we are, what we do. Um, we have about 1,500 staff working across uh, six business units within HBS, uh, about 1,500 strong of a workforce. Um, and you can see that we're very geographically dispersed uh, around the country. Heavy, uh, heavy users of technology and um, uh, digital and digital innovation would be very much part of um, the, the strategy for HBS. 
In terms of our activities, um, this is a snapshot of the, the level of transactions that we would undertake on behalf of the HSE and um, beyond the HSE, uh, former staff who we pay pensions to, um, we pay suppliers, the largest purchaser of goods in the state. So we would be, um, we would be um, processing uh, 2.3 million worth of invoices per annum, 91% of all HSE invoices. Um, you'll see at the centre there, we do guard the vetting on behalf of the HSE as well, and that's something I'll touch on in a little while. Um, so just moving on from that, <clears throat> we, um, we were contacted by Philip and the team in Deeper, um, I suppose it's almost two years ago now, to ascertain our interest in, in RPA. Um, and they worked with us to I suppose, assess the viability of RPA against a number of processes. And we selected five or six processes at the time for an assessment and settled on two. Um, so I suppose the stars aligned for us towards the second half of last year, where we had the funding in place, we had done a market test to understand what the level of cost would be to, to undertake the pilot, applied for that funding. The framework came into place um, in around August 2019, um, which was awarded to Deloitte. Um, and we got a window of opportunity with the subject matter experts in both of those um, um, HBS business units as well, uh, the finance and HR business units. So we drew down the services of Deloitte in November 2019. Uh, we commenced the, the, the engagement with them um, a week before Christmas. People thought we were mad, but um, it, it turned out to be a stroke of good luck, really, that we started so quickly. And we had both projects completed and in what I call light production uh, by the end of February. And now, what I mean by that is <clears throat> we had um, trial software um, from UiPath, we were running both processes on a, a trial version of Orchestrator. And also we were running the, the processes on virtual desktops as opposed to a proper server environment. But we proved the concept and it was quite successful in that, in, in that regard. Um, so just to talk about each of the processes then, uh, the finance business unit uh, had settled on this particular uh, process to, to test the theory of automation, I suppose, and principle of it. It was a, they picked it really because of its stability, and um, they didn't want something that was overly complex, and it was a low risk. If it didn't work, it wasn't going to be the end of the world. We weren't going to be on the front pages. Um, but in that regard, I suppose, it was quite a successful outcome uh, in that, apart from the time savings that were achieved, uh, which were significant, um, the staff and the business unit itself gained a lot of confidence uh, about uh, or uh, around the technology. Um, they, they were, I suppose, emboldened now to, to uh, consider RPA for a lot of the other processes, which are maybe a little bit more complex and certainly a um, uh, lot, uh, lot higher risk, I suppose, in terms of uh, um, success and failure. But um, it was a very good outcome from the point of view of having finance people confident in, in the technology. Uh, the HR process then was um, something that we, we spent a lot of time thinking about and trying to select the right one. A guard of vetting uh, and guard, the guard of vetting unit in our national personnel records department in particular were severely under pressure. Um, the process itself was, was reasonably stable, uh, but there was a series of, of checks contained within, within it um, that you know, certainly wasn't uh, very straightforward. Um, so what this involves really is our Garda Vetting Liaison Office, who partner with our Garda Shiakana to, um, to process Garda Vetting requests. Uh, at the when the vetting notification is received back from Angarda Shikana, uh, it is sent to our national personnel records uh, colleagues to then upload the uh, results of the vetting into the HR um, system in SAP. So basically, it's updating the employee's record with the vetting status. 
um, and a number of checks are done against both SAP and an internal system uh, can and therefore to uh, ensure that we're matching the correct vetting record with the correct employee. Um, there was a, another pressure looming, I suppose, on that department, and that was the enactment of uh, new Garda vetting uh, legislation, which will require the HSE to revet staff and only relevant staff, uh, those working with children or vulnerable adults, uh, or in, uh, who are exposed to either either um, cohort of, of patients. Uh, so revetting staff every uh, three years, I think, is 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 what's been settled upon uh, was potentially going to increase the load to and possibly threefold on that department uh, who were already under pressure. So um, the, the results uh, from, from this particular uh, automation have been astounding to be honest. Um, we've re relieved the staff there of 500 hours per work of that transactional checking work uh, that they, you know they had a team of three three people, four people at times, uh, matching and, and correcting information over three to three and a half weeks at a time. Um, we've, we've now reduced the, the, the monthly upload. Uh, sorry, in crisis, it was, depends on what way you look at it. We were doing a monthly upload, now we're doing a weekly upload because the robot is able to do it so much faster. Um, and the robot in any given week, and this has been sustained right the last three months can do in six hours what one person would have taken three weeks to do. Uh, so it's it's a really astounding uh, result for us and has emboldened, I suppose, that department to now look at other ways that uh, that robot can be similarly uh, deployed for other um, for other transactional processes. I mean, a, a robot. Uh, when you take on a robot, uh, you're taking on. A, a virtual worker that has 160 hours, 168 hours of, of working time in a week. Um, Bertie, as they, they titled, as they call the robot in, in NPR, is working for six to seven hours a week. So really just using 4% of Bertie's time. Um, and they really don't want Bertie leaning on a shovel. They, they want to uh, sweat uh, the, 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 the time that that robot has and um, they're looking at further uh, opportunities now for, for automation. So at the end of February, we were quite pleased with ourselves and um, started thinking immediately then about building a proper platform. I mentioned earlier that we were on temporary infrastructure and temporary software. So we wanted to stabilize that and uh, build a proper server environment for HBS for those processes and to explore what it would take to build a center of excellence and to look at the skills that we would need to become self-sufficient, which was really the, the goal of the framework and uh, Deeper's vision uh, from day one on that. Um, but, you know, uh, the ultimate disruptor came along in uh, early March. I was just back from leave and um, was suddenly uh, <laughs> significantly disrupted, me and all of my team uh, and who were then moved to help with the COVID effort. Uh, in response to the emergency. Um, I suppose what it, it did, and they say you never waste a crisis, um, the coronavirus pandemic uh, did lead people to start thinking differently and to examine new ways of working. Um, uh, Minister Harris uh, announcing the recruitment drive for doctors and nurses and, and, and moving interns quickly to the front line. It, you know, the good fortune we had to start uh, at the tail end of 2019 came to pass because Bertie was up and running and we were able to process Garda vettings to get those staff into the front line in a far more efficient manner than we would have been able to previously. Uh, so um, we, 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 he arrived, I suppose, it arrived uh, literally uh, in the nick of time, um, a week or two before the, the major surge came. Uh, and NPR were well able to, to deal with that additional volume that was hitting them. Similarly, Mark has spoken about uh, the Matter Hospital and um, the, the um, interest that they took and, and, and how they, took, how they um, implemented uh, UiPath robots to help in the infection control areas. 
as part of that seconded role uh, that I spoke about for COVID, uh, one of my, my tasks was to send a positive patient assessment report from a new CRM tool that we had developed uh, across to the Health Protection Surveillance Centre uh, on a daily basis and at the peak of the crisis twice daily. And really what they, what they had to do with that then was upload that data manually into their CIDR system, the, the computerized infectious disease reporting system. And uh, so the dots were joined and um, we asked Deloitte to go in and speak to the people in HPSC uh, to have a look to see what could be automated or to, to, to what extent it could be automated because we had public health staff from right across the country having to manually upload information that they were receiving digitally into their own system. Um, so that work has been ongoing and uh, Mark mentioned it a little bit earlier um, and I, I, I think I'll be touching on it later on but certainly that, that hookup happened as well. And also we've been hearing conversations and had conversations with other areas within the health service. Um, more, most recently the immunization office which has to tackle a backlog of vaccinations for school children who they weren't able to get to because the schools are closed. So that's a request that's in with the office of the CIO at the moment and some work is ongoing on that. So yeah, we were, we were suitably disrupted and really had to accelerate our plans towards building that enterprise RPA platform, not only for the HPS processes, but now also the HPSC process when it came online and, and other um, automations that would, would come on stream uh, over time. So we took the approach that um, we, we, we would build this for everybody, um, uh, following you know, the principles uh, laid out in, in many policy documents. So we've built, uh, we just completed the build on an enterprise RPA platform in the HSE's National Data Center. Um, it's a non-premise solution. We have three environments, uh, UAT, Dev and Production. Uh, it was a six week build, uh, Deloitte were involved in that and uh, we commenced that in mid-May um, and completed it at the end of June. Our two existing HPS processes are now in full production, they're on that system running and we got the word yesterday from HPSC, HPSC, correct, yeah, that um, they, are, they have agreed to move the, 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 the testing that they were doing, the pilot, uh, into, uh, into that production environment and that will be live by mid-August. Uh, I mentioned we're on premise uh, at the moment, and uh, that was the advice we, we took from the technology and deployment section within the office of the CIO. But um, uh, we, it would be remiss of us to, uh, to ignore the benefits of cloud or even private cloud uh, down the road. So we'd certainly be uh, considering that um, as and when it's applicable to us. Um, you know, there was a, a lot of moving parts involved in building the, the platform. It's, it's not straightforward. All, everything we're doing uh, in terms of the, the robots and the robots work is, is happening uh, on virtual desktop in, uh, infrastructure in the NDC also. Um, and the naming conventions for the robot accounts and so on was agreed with the office of the CIO. So we've, we've worked in partnership with, uh, with um, James Carroll and his team in technology and deployment throughout. The Centre of Excellence then, we had to, you know, again, we were, we were back in February, um, we were probably had a, a lot of more of a limited scope uh, than, than, than we do have now. And we're looking, considering all of the, the areas that are taking on um, RPA and considering it, our challenge was to consider how you might deliver a Centre of Excellence that suited everybody uh, and that was a good fit for this organization. Um, some of the considerations that we had to give to this was, you know, HBS took a decision to offer this as a new shared service offering. So we're, we're, we are a shared service organization. Uh, this was deemed to be a very good fit for such an organization. Um, what we want to do in principle really is to develop a virtual worker agency. And that means we, we, we will manage the agency, if you like, and we'll provide the robot as a shell and the various um, health agencies, entities or whatever they might be, can then put the uniform on, the, on, on that shell, uh, the virtual worker shell, and apply it to whatever task it needs to apply it to. Uh, but at the back end, we will, 
manage the, the release of that robot and ensuring the robot is there that it turns up for work and time and then can report on its activities um, and, and, and manage its performance if you like and ensure that that's, that infrastructure is working correctly so that the worker is always available when it needs to be. The principle here was that we needed to have centralized management but federated delivery and that's the, 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 the principle really we've applied to the, the design. It's very important that we do this in alignment with various policies that we're guided by, uh, specifically salon to care, which does tell us to um, provide our health workers with modern digital tools. Uh, the one voice for pro health procurement, so procuring things in a singular fashion, uh, whatever that might be, uh, technology is no exception in that regard. We need to comply with our NFRs, national financial regulations. And also the public service IT strategy, which talks about build to share, um, having improved governance and, and increasing capability. I suppose as we mature, we wanted to graduate from just purely task automation to process re-engineering and, and getting people to actually examine what it is they do, uh, what their processes do, how can they lean those processes. Um, and we have an operational excellence uh, unit within health business and services that we've tied into uh, and are looking at how that could link also with the, the area of RPA and how we can uh, merge the two, uh, or al certainly align the two, uh, the two units. And why we're on here today really is this, this um, center of excellence and this technology does support that jobs of the future. The, the World Economic Forum uh, report from 2018, uh, uh, jobs, uh, the future of work report, does really put the likes of RPA uh, development, uh, business analysis, um, those types of roles right at the center of future jobs. Um, and some of the jobs that are currently being done where we're manually processing uh, information are under threat. So we do want to uh, upskill people um, and, 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 and through, the, through the, the link with the, the digital academy. The typical roles, and I won't spend too long on this, it's a little bit of a busy slide, but we identified sort of five work streams. Uh, you know, it's not all just RPA development. There's a lot more to it. Um, so there's the relationship management and the skills development, which is core to the work of the Digital Academy uh, and the, the, the alignment with uh, UiPath and Deloitte. And process refinement, again, I've just spoken about that and the, the, the tie-in with operational excellence. Then there's the, the project onboarding and the office at CIO have a project management office who oversee all requests for funding for technology projects. And certainly we'd be hooking in with them and perhaps coordinating all requests through to the, the PMO. The development itself, um, yes, we, we do want to become self-sufficient, but we don't want to become a, a stumbling block or a bottleneck for, for, for any uh, of the, the various health agencies who want to move at a, at a, at a particular pace. Um, so uh, we do need developers, but we need um, a, an avenue out to development skills as well in, 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 the, uh, in the external, with our external partners. And then there's the management of the, the architecture itself. And like I said earlier on, making sure the robots turn up for work when they're meant to turn up for work, that the platform is running, we have resilience in us uh, and, and business continuity measures are in place. So uh, with that in mind, we had to explore which, which model best fits. Um, and I mean, this slide could be used for any type of a technology uh, approach and not just RPA, but uh, and, and these are the, the problems and the challenges facing uh, many organizations in this regard. The centralized approach, I suppose, um, is the ideal world, but the danger in it is that the central becomes a bottleneck. Um, the decentralized, uh, you know, will not achieve the economies of scale and won't uh, allow us to have any consist consistency in terms of our approach or our standards. So we've had a look uh, at the, the federated model, which is a hybrid of the two. It will deliver that higher pace that we need, but we realize that we must retain some elements uh, to, to, to control spend and to ensure standards. So it's really the federated model is the one we've, we've, we've looked at in, in much greater depth to satisfy what we feel this organization needs. So, in, on that basis, this is the proposed model. Um, I say it's a, it's a draft. Uh, not too many people have seen it, but I think this is the the, the approach that we feel is is correct for the HSE. 
So at the very core, we have a, a central representative governance and steering group, which defines strategy, uh, sets a selection criteria for RPA, uh, because there are points at which RPA is an expensive way of automating a product. It may not be the best tool. And um, so we, we would have those selection criteria to just make sure that we're hitting a certain, a certain bar on every automation. And then the approval of RPA application tool process, there, there, there may be a strategic reason why we don't want to pursue RPA in that particular instance. There may be a new system coming down the pipes in 18 months, which would invalidate the, the, the cost of doing RPA in the first place. So it's for that central and steering group to have that visibility uh, and to make those decisions. Uh, you know, but as I say, absolutely representative of every section of the organization. The, the People part of this then, and this is where the Digital Academy uh, are going to be uh, absolutely essential to, to all of this. Uh, and it's just to, to embed that culture, that automation mindset right throughout the health sector, to, to do the upskilling, to do the awareness, um, and to establish those links with the training and academic institutions. In terms of the operated projects then, the, the alignment of projects, getting the funding in place, um, ensuring the, the, the correct documentation is in place, doing the process mapping, uh, all of that. Uh, we see that as a, as, as, as a second function uh, within the COE. The RPA operations then, this is really keeping the lights on. The Office of the CIO will build us the environment, but uh, we, we need to have uh, infrastructure staff um, managing, maintaining, um, managing change change in the system even um, so that's going to be an essential part of of the, uh, the the center of excellence and then there's the the federated part of this where we'll establish uh, our, and and then support local rpa delivery hubs and i've done this as uh, for illustrative purposes only i've taken the same entities that have been talking to us and talking to others about rpa where we, we will see local centers of excellence or local delivery hubs uh, being spun up um, in, in probably in the larger organizations, um, but that doesn't eliminate the, the opportunity for automation in smaller entities uh, who, who wouldn't ever consider having a, um, a, a local delivery hub itself. And we will manage that process for them through the RPA projects uh, team. But this model, we believe, kind of gives us that centralized management, but with the federated delivery capability and allows the, the RPA hubs uh, to, to move at the pace that they need to move at, uh, but all the while tied into a, a central pillar that ensures economy of scale, uh, ensures standards and consistency in approach. Um, particularly like this, because this, this does involve change and it's going to uproot a lot of what we're doing at the moment. But if we want different results, we must change the way we do things. And at that, I'd like to say thanks to everybody. Uh, I want to acknowledge particularly um, the OGP, uh, the framework they've put in is, is excellent and really easy to use. Um, I want to thank Philip and the team and Deeper who really set us on this path and encouraged us to, to move forward. Uh, the Office of the CIO, whether that's the technology and deployment team or Martin and his Digital Academy team have been really encouraging in, in, in helping us on this journey. And Deloitte and UiPath for, for their help and support in what we've been trying to do for the last year, year and a half. So with that, Mark, I'll, I'll hand it back to you. That's great, Kevin. Thanks very much for that. So um, uh, we're going to pass on now to Louise McEntee from Deloitte. And then when Louise is finished, Martin's going to do a quick wrap up and then we can go through if anybody has a Q&A, if anybody has any questions. Thanks, Mark. And thanks, my and Kevin. I suppose uh, a big thank you to you as well, Kevin. In fairness, you're the driving force behind automation and HSE at the moment. And and I, think I would reiterate that point, Louise. It's been brilliant yeah. to see the vision that Kevin has had and how it's been deployed and just the, the ability of the buy-in that he's getting right across the entire healthcare sector for this vision. Just need to learn how to use PowerPoint now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we're all in that boat, Kevin. 
Um, I suppose a big thank you as well to the team. So we've been working with Kevin over the last number of months, but I suppose we cannot underestimate just how hands-on all of the teams in the individual business areas have been. HBS, HR, and the National Personnel Office in the Health Prevention Surveillance Centre, and in the, um, the finance team within Income Services. Like they are the people who are identifying the opportunities for automation. They're the people who are helping us to work through blow by blow, what does this robot need to do and what are the concerns we need to deal with? Like, I suppose that's the, the key message, I suppose, for and the key learning from us throughout all this is to make sure that we have those blended teams in place every time that you have the right people from the HSC driving this activity. And I suppose great to see the investment from um, UI Pathway and training and supporting you guys to, number one, understand the opportunity within RPA, but number two, then how do I act on that? How do I go from I have an idea to putting that into practice? Um, uh, part of the vision, I suppose, that, that Philip called out earlier about the RPA framework is, is building that internal capacity and that capability within all of the public sector. And I suppose it was a key component of the framework bid that we put back was training offering. Um, we've been discussing with Martin and Ross um, uh, options on how to support you. And Martin and Ross, thanks, Wayne, for inviting me to, to chat today. But I just wanted to give you a quick overview. I'm conscious with one eye on the clock. Um, of the training offering that is available to you. So we've been discussing with Martin and, and Ross over the last number of weeks, well, actually over the last number of months, if we don't count that COVID disruption in the middle, but we there are there is a training pathway there for everybody in the public sector that's available to you through the RPA framework. It goes from beginner through intermediate and all the way to advanced. And it's, it's aimed to get you from, I don't know what RPA is all the way up to, I know what this is, I can apply it in my business area and I can actually start to even think about taking on um, the development tasks as well within that. Equally, you can stop at any point as well. And I suppose that's the, point, the, the, the bits that I think a lot of the people so far have spoken today about are, not everybody wants to be an RPA developer. Some people just wanna see how do I apply this within my business area. I suppose that's the aim of the, that first beginner training, which we're hoping we will run probably likely over September and October with, through the Digital Academy, um, is to help you identify what is an opportunity for RPA and help you then go from, well, I have an idea. I want to process, map out my process in quite a bit of detail. I want to get to a high level solution design and I want to be able to assess what the return might be off that, that individual automation opportunity. Um, the training in Deloitte, is very much focused on the skills. It's not specific to any one vendor, but obviously it will complement everything that Mark and Francis and the team and UiPath are pointing you to in the in the academy. But it, the first wave that we're hoping to run is probably uh, the beginner course. As I said, normally we would do this in a classroom environment, but obviously with COVID-19 restrictions at the minute, we're thinking this will be run virtually, but we'll confirm that with you over the next couple of weeks. Um, there are other trainings available on the framework and this is probably in time when you get out of the blocks and get your first few automations under the belt with that opportunity to exploit the full capability that exists within some of this automation software around machine learning, cognitive, um, NLP, lo lots of various more advanced um, techniques that are enabled and are all provided through the software that, that you're already using today. But I suppose it's an evolution. I suppose the thinking at the moment is get started, get people to get the core skills built and then we'll see how that can evolve over time. Um, I suppose over the last number of weeks and months, we've been working with Kevin as well in terms of how we can help to support um, the evolution of, of automation within HSE. I suppose there is there were some thinking at the moment around how do we help the Centre of Excellence and how do we help local delivery hubs to really get up and running quickly around both the skills you're going to need to identify opportunities and to start to build on those opportunities but also then to help fast track you in terms of a path, like a pipeline of work as to where you start. Because it, it is a big deal to take this on and it will be a big effort, but I suppose if we can put in place the training behind you and the support behind you to help you do it, and also the methods and tools that are gonna be built through the RPA COE that you can get, the, get your hands on those quickly and get your head around how to use them locally, that will hopefully help support you for success over the coming months. This is uh, early days of the minute, but that's, I suppose, one of the offerings we're hoping we'll be able to bring through the, the COE model over the coming months. So there are there is a first wave of training proposed, and these are indicative dates of the minute, proposed dates for September and October, depending on who may want to be involved. But you can get in touch with Martin and with Ross um, to indicate your interest to get involved. But we'll be running the training over a four-week period. Normally, this would be a short and sharp five-day training um, with a follow-on five-day training for developers, but 
bearing in mind this would be delivered virtually, we, we thought it's probably better to break that up and help manage your time. So as we know, most of you are also running very, very hectic day jobs and dealing with a huge amount of pressure elsewhere. So this is the thinking at the moment. It, it may slightly change over the coming weeks and months, but they're the proposed dates. So please do get in touch um, with Martin, with Ross, with Kevin, if you're interested in getting involved in that first wave of training that we'll run in the autumn. That's it for me. Don't have much else to add at this point. I might pass you back. Is it to Mark or to Martin then? Uh, it's to me, Louise. Thank you very much. Um, so we will be within the next week, we'll actually have a registration uh, website um, so that anybody that's interested in actually making a career and really making a difference through RPA. I think we've had a, you know, a really interesting and really compelling um, sort of introduction uh, to, to RPA. We all know sort of hospitals and, and community centers and primary care centers. Um, the business of healthcare is probably the most information intense business that exists. But overall, compared to other industries, we're very, very underinvested in information technology and digital. I think we will have all had experiences in terms of interacting with the healthcare system where we deal with uh, just first class, you know, doctors and nurses and physios and so on. But we're really, you know, using a very antiquated 19th century sort of management system with, with paper everywhere. Uh, we think there is a real opportunity and in fact our goal is to transform over the next uh, three to five years and RPA is going to be a central uh, part of that. So just to recap, I gave a brief introduction uh, to the Digital Academy and where RPA fits in it. We had Philip talk about, Philip McGrath from Deeper talk about actually how central uh, RPA is becoming to a government uh, strategy. You know, thanks to Chris Studridge, VP from UiPath, uh, who emphasized UiPath's commitment uh, to work with the HSE uh, to you know, have success. I really like the title of Francis's uh, uh, role in terms of customer success. And I really have to acknowledge, you know, Mark and Francis, they have been really proactive uh, partners in, in terms of trying to establish a, a program around uh, skills lifting for HSE employees. Uh, Kevin Kelly has been the heartbeat of um, RPA at, at HSE. And you might have heard the expression overnight success takes on average two years. And Kevin has been plugging away uh, you know, for the last two years in terms of trying to establish uh, an RPA COE. And I think has a really compelling vision. He's going to be collaborating with Tom Laffin from the office of the CIO. So we create the infrastructure and the systems that we could do you know, large scale RPA um, across uh, the, the, the HSC and, and beyond. And then finally, thanks to Louise McEntee from uh, Deloitte. Uh, earlier this year, we ran a very successful one day um, seminar on uh, RPA and we had several speakers from the NHS. Uh, the NHS are considerably ahead of the HSC in terms of adoption of RPA. And we're going to use the HSC or the NHS as a model for implementation uh, of RPA uh, across the HSC. Uh, Louise has uh, you know, uh, announced the provisional dates for when our training offerings start. It's you know, the 10th of September, and that's to initially focus on the business analyst training. And in the next week, we'll be tweeting uh, the registration link uh, so that you can, um, if you're interested, uh, sign up for, for the training. Uh, to each of you individually, there obviously is a big contribution to be made to the efficiency, eff effectiveness, and the experience of our health service. But can I encourage you? I think the RPA career path can be one that's you know really um, compelling. I showed in my presentation sort of the many areas where there is the opportunity for uh, high impact uh, automation. So this, this isn't a short journey. This isn't a flash in the pan for six months. This is something that uh, will continue. It's a five to 10 year journey to introduce RPA um, across the system. And I, I'm convinced at the end, when I, at the end of this journey, and it probably will be a never ending journey as we continue to innovate, 
the overall efficiency and effectiveness uh, and the experience of the health uh, service uh, will be significantly improved. So, improved. Uh, so before we go into the panel that will be led by Mark, I want to thank our speakers uh, for today. I also want to thank you, uh, the audience. Uh, I think we have approximately 60 people uh, on this webinar, which is uh, you know, tremendous. And we we'll look forward to, we're on the, in the very early days of starting this journey. Um, it's a long journey, but it's going to be a very rewarding journey. So thank you to all. So I'll hand you over to Mark, who's going to lead the Q&A session. Okay, um, thanks very much, Martin. Um, I think as we've gone along, we've actually answered a lot of the questions that have come in. Um, and just so if anyone does have any more questions, if they can use the Q&A button, but I understand everybody is, is very busy and they've been on for quite a long time. What we are going to re reiterate here is that from a UiPath perspective, uh, via Martin and Lorraine and the team there with Ross and Des, we're going to be running uh, an Automation Hub training session next week, um, which we've already had nearly 40 people doing. Um, and I'm also happy to go to any of the larger uh, organizations and do training. So as an example, I have 40 people doing training at half 12 in the Matter Hospital on Automation Hub because as, as Louise would have, have said at the start there, you know, it, there's lots of different roles within here. And what we need to understand is where, where you see yourself fitting within this. Are you somebody who has an idea? Are you somebody who wants to be a developer? Are you somebody who wants to be a business analyst? So we're happy to go and do the introduction to RPA session, which then morphs into the automation hub. And in reality, with the automation hub tool, that enabled the Matter Hospital to record their own processes and see the suitability for automation. And, you know, obviously what we're looking to do here is that there is the framework in place with Louise and the team there. So if you need help from, from there, we're willing to support, we're supporting the team and Deloitte on a day-to-day -day basis. But fundamentally where we'd like to get is help the HSE and I know where Philip is to make yourself self-sufficient to fit into the roles that Kevin has spoken about where we have the local hubs. But in reality, it's an investment in yourselves. You know, what you're doing here is you're upskilling yourselves and you're bringing new skills to the organization, which is having a brilliant knock-on effect to the Irish citizens. And is giving us, and as Martin has said since the start of the Digital Academy, it's really bringing that vision through because nobody has a knowledge better than the existing staff that already work in the HSC. And how do we generate that information? And that's what we want to do is show people how they can submit their ideas, how they can submit their improvements. And the, the results that Kevin has spoken about and the work we did in the Matter Hospital uh, have been phenomenal. Um, I, I, it's quite funny, I did, we ended up doing interviews with the Wall Street Journal uh, CNN, you know, it's been picked up all around the world, but that was an idea of a nurse using our tool within 15 minutes had generated an idea and that idea ended up making a massive difference during COVID and now is making a massive difference across infection control across the entire hospital, which now has the buy-in of the CEO of the hospital to say, I want to roll this out across the entire organization. And the great thing with that was they didn't need to upgrade any of their existing IT systems. The big worry there was doing this would have a knock-on effect of having to upgrade IT systems. We used the existing infrastructure that was already there and gave the savings of time back to each of those nurses. And this could be anywhere across the HSE, could be finance, could be HR as, as, as Kevin has, has spoken about. And look, from our side of things there, we're willing to engage with anyone. Our training is available. You can log on straight away, start on that journey. If you have any queries, contact myself or Francis at any time. You've got the structured training coming up with the team, with the team in Deloitte and via Martin. But what we want to do is help people get on that journey themselves. And if you need any help from ourselves and UiPath, happy to engage. So I don't see any other questions coming in on the Q&A. So Iger, we've done a really, really good job on the presentations, um, and which is, the, which is the, the version I'm going to take from this now. And, uh, but as I said, happy to engage with, with anyone at, at any stage. So 
Uh, what I'll do is we'll, we'll wrap up here for today. Uh, thank you all for your time today. Hope you found it extremely useful and we look forward to engaging with you all in the future. So thank you very much. Thanks everyone. Thanks Mark. Thanks, bye. Bye. Right. bye bye. Thank you. Thanks everybody. All the best. Bye.